This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated right now in Christ Jesus, in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. So I'm taught the Word of God. My life has changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. Well, you may be seated. We've been learning over the last three weeks that God wants you to have the desires of your heart. God wants you to have what you will. And it is the will of God to bless you with good things. Right off the bat, people new to the church have a problem with the word things. Well, after church is over and you go to lunch, what are you going to eat? A spiritual? Talk to me. What are you going to eat? A spiritual? What did, you, what did you put around your body this morning? Spirituals? No. How, how are you going to pay the, uh, the electric company on the next bill? Are you going to just pray over that envelope? No. What are you going to use? Things. We, it's just maddening the lack of common sense out here. How can God be against things? And people that are against things obviously have never read Matthew chapter 6. We're not going to go there. But Jesus talked about things. Now, over the last three weeks, we have been emphasizing the prayer of faith from Mark 11, 23 and 24. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore, I, this is Jesus, say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. We've also been emphasizing Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 103, verse 1, praise the Lord. Verse 5, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. We've been giving you Isaiah 119. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. But a lot of people would have you believe that if you are willing and obedient, you're going to eat what is left over when the world gets done eating. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says if you are willing and obedient, you will eat from the best of the land. John 15, 7, Jesus said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. We gave you a paraphrase. If you live in, settle down in, take up residence in me and my words. Live in, settle down in, take up residence in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. You know, the more we get immersed in the Word of God, the more likely we are to see the promises of the Word of God come to pass in our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11, God does have a plan for you, but it's not a plan to mess you up. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope in the future. Say it out loud. God has a plan, God has a plan. and God's plan, God's plan is to prosper me and to give me hope and a future. We've been giving you Psalm 35, 27, let the Lord be magnified who hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And that word is the Hebrew word shalom, means total well-being. And remember Jesus said in Matthew 9, 29, according to your faith, will it be done unto you? According to your faith, will it be done unto you? And central to our thinking the last three Sundays is verse 24 of Mark 11. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you shall have them. So we said a couple of weeks back, that puts you in the driver's seat because he said, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And of course, this creates problems because you got one person and they believe God and they are willing and they are obedient and they receive stuff. 
And that's always a problem for the person going to church who is unwilling and unobedient, disobedient, and they don't receive stuff. Now, last week we left off with this thought. Sitting here today, you are the sum total of everything you have believed, everything you have said, and everything you have done. And if you don't believe words are important, just think about these words. I do. Just think about these words. With all my worldly goods, I thee endow. Now, you get down the road a few decades, and you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, and you decide you want to break that vow, those words are going to be important. With all my worldly goods. When I said that to Sue, we did, I didn't have anything. I had no debt, but I, I had no money. And then at the reception, her grandpa gave us $400. So see, my net worth went up within a few minutes. <laughs> but uh, so I could have parted with half at that moment. It wouldn't have been painful. Well, you know, 38 years later, I'd feel it. So tell your neighbor, words matter. Word now, the point of the message this morning is that we make our own way prosperous by what we believe, by what we say, and by what we do. Say it out loud. We make our own way prosperous by what we believe, by what we say, and by what we do. So no one can do it for you. I can't do it for you. You have to make your own way prosperous. And you can make your own way prosperous by what you believe, by what you say, and by what you do. Now we left off last time on the saying part of the prayer of faith. Look at Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 12, 14. From the fruit of his lips a man is filled with good things. So our lips actually produce fruit. You know, in my backyard, I've got pecan trees. I've got different kind. They call one, I think, long shale, and I forget what they call the other one. Well, you know what kind of tree it is by what's dropping on the ground underneath it. Well, our lips produce fruit, whether good or bad, and we determine the fruit that we generate by what we believe and by what we say. Because Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever I've been putting into my heart is what's going to come out of my mouth. Mark eleven twenty three. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Now, it doesn't say you'll have what you want. It doesn't say you'll have what you believe. Jesus did not say you'll have the will of God. He did not even say you're going to have God's plan for your life or God's best. No, he said, whatsoever you saith. So we're going to have what we say. God wants you to have the best, but to have the best, you've got to be willing and obedient. You must believe the best is God's will for your life. And you must say that God's best belongs to you. And then you've got to take action congruent with or lined up with what you believe and what you say. See, the prophet Isaiah said, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the best from the land. And uh, some people are willing, but they're not obedient. Other people are obedient, but they're not willing. I've got a lady here this morning. She told me out here a few months back, she grew up in a full gospel church and she tithed her whole life and never got any benefit out of it because it was presented as a drudgery. It was presented as a burden. She came here a little over a year ago. She said, you, you teach giving diametrically opposite of what I grew up with. She said, you teach it as an opportunity. So she said, I began doing exactly what I had been doing in drudgery, but I began doing it in joy. I began doing it in faith. I began doing it, here it is, believing I receive. And she said, everything changed. My income changed. Everything changed. See, it's not just a matter of being obedient. It's a matter of being willing. It's not just a matter of being willing. It's a matter of being obedient. So whatever you're doing today is a seed sown for tomorrow. Whatever you give or do or say today is a seed sown 
for what you are going to experience tomorrow. If you will get God's word into your heart and coming up out of your mouth, then that's what you're going to have next week, next month, next year. See, if God has given us the ability to create our own environment, well, why not create a good one? Our dreams, our desires, our prayers are not just about us, though. They're about the next generation. See, the righteous ought not just be blessed. They ought to leave a legacy for the next generation. Proverbs 13, says, A good man, a righteous man, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. You know, uh, my son has started studying some writings of a rabbi. And he's got me thoroughly hooked on this. I'm thinking, you know, goodbye, Christian world. Goodbye, loserdom. I'm going to study what this rabbi's got to say about prosperity. Tell your neighbor. He done went off the reservation. (laughs) Hey, because a lot of this world out here, you know, they're like, I don't want no prosperity. If you don't want to prosper, you hate your children. If you don't want to be a success in life, you hate your children. I said hate. You hate them. Well, that's a strong word. What kind of person doesn't want to clothe their children? What kind of person doesn't want to educate their children? What does it take to clothe children? Talk to me. What does it take to clothe children? What does it take to feed children? What does it take to educate children? Yeah, but you know, I started with nothing, and looked how, look how I turned out. Okay, okay, well, maybe you're the exception. I, I myself was cut off at 18. All right. But that's not what I want for my children. I don't want my children to have to start, come out of the gate with nothing. I don't want my grandchildren to have to get all kinds of loans, and when they graduate from college, these kids coming out of college today owe $110,000, $120,000. When my grandchildren come out of college, what's it going to be? A half a million dollars because of the way they're printing money? No, your needs being met and having more than you need isn't just about you. It's about your family. It's about your spouse. It's about your children. It's about your grandchildren. It's about the church. It's about the kingdom of God. We need more simply because the world is being overrun by a religion that will chop off your head in Oklahoma if you disagree with them. Well, they have oil. Well, you have the Holy Spirit. You have the living God. Surely we ought to be able to outperform them, right? If you're living paycheck to paycheck, how can you be a blessing to your family, much less the kingdom of God? If you're living Friday to Friday, how can you be a blessing to your own family, much less the kingdom of God? If your needs are not met, how can you be a blessing to your own family, let alone the kingdom of God? If you don't have more than enough, how can you be a blessing to your own family, let alone the kingdom of God? And this is why people who are anti-prosperity, people who are anti-success, people who have no interest in learning how to prosper are really selfish. You know, when I would hardly ride out west, and especially in Arizona and New Mexico in the wintertime, uh, the people that uh, are retired, you know, they'd be down in that area. A lot, of, a lot of like Winnebago's and travel trailers and things. And I saw a lot of bumper stickers. We're spending our children's inheritance. And that, I was always appalled by that. I mean, it might be okay to enjoy your retirement years. It might be okay to travel. But why would anybody confess I'm spending my children's inheritance? This is what's wrong with America. This is what's wrong. Let me tell you what. We went from the greatest generation to the most selfish generation. Your 
grandchildren's grandchildren will be paying for people having abortions tomorrow morning. Interest on it. No, no, no. A people that loves their children, a people that loves their grandchildren, they don't spend more than they take in and they, they save up money, they set money aside because their heart is for their children, their heart is for their grandchildren. And how about the kingdom of God? How about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You are sitting in a country that spends more money annually on cat food than they give into every church and every Christian ministry in America. And cats lived millions of years without cat food. So people just care about themselves. They're not interested in learning how to have more than enough so they can be a blessing. And look, if you say, well, I, I don't want anything else. I think this pair of pants will last me until I die. I think this underwear is good enough until I go to be with Jesus. <laughs> All right. Well, how about just making some extra to be a blessing into the kingdom of God? How about that? How about having more than you need to be a blessing to somebody maybe that is uh, unemployed? Amen. Taking groceries to somebody that lost their job. A man that does work at my house uh, was down a couple of weeks because he'd had a surgery, injury related to the work, not at my house, but somewhere. And so when he came back to work, you know, I thought, man, I'm blessed, I'm blessed. And so I, I paid him what I owed him and I paid him more. I thought if everybody just gave the guy a little more, it'd make up for the two weeks he missed working. We don't, we don't need to go to stand in line at some government office if we just all had more than we needed. And when we came across people that were in need, we say, well, I'm blessed. What difference does it make to me? And just be a blessing. But how can you be a blessing if you don't have food in your refrigerator? How can you be a blessing if you don't have food in your pantry? See, every Christian generation should walk in a greater degree of blessing than the previous generation. My unsaved father knew this. My unsaved father would often say every generation ought to improve itself. An unsaved man. Every generation shouldn't have to start from scratch. And certainly the second or third generation should not apologize or be embarrassed by the blessings of the first generation. You know, if you're bored, there's nothing on TV. There's no movies coming up. The whole thing is ridiculous. Order the set of DVDs from Amazon, the History Channel, The Men Who Built America. And, and I wrote to them and I said, you did the series, The Men Who Built America. Why don't you do a series on The Men Who Wrecked America? <laughs> Start with Woodrow Wilson, the Federal Reserve, the Infernal Reven Revenge Service. I mean, Vanderbilt and Rockefeller and, and Henry Ford and Thomas Edison and, and they created millions of jobs and they, they, they built a middle class society. And now we have a generation of iPad boys living in their mommy's basements uh, apologizing for our success and prosperity. If you as a second generation Christian apologize for or embarrassed by or change what you believe in order to make the world happy, well, you're going to have to do without the blessings your parents experienced. If you started with nothing, that's one thing, but your children and your grandchildren shouldn't have to start with nothing. A good man. A righteous man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Well, how can a righteous man leave an inheritance not just for his children, but his grandchildren if he can't even pay his own bills? So there has to be provision. God doesn't want us to just have our needs met. God wants us to have more than we need. Philippians 4, 18. I am amply supplied, Paul wrote. But if you, if you listen to people in social media, you'd think that Jesus and the disciples were a bunch of homeless folk. Paul said, I am amply supplied. 
When you obey God, Deuteronomy 28, 11 says, the Lord will grant you abundant prosperity. When a man fears the Lord and obeys him, Psalm 25, 13, David wrote, he will spend his days in prosperity. And I realize I'm completely counterculture here because the culture is preaching scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. And I, I mentioned last Sunday, you know, the very same week, the very same week, the very same week that in America, in a lot of big cities, they had these climate change marches. And did you see the photographs of how the climate change marchers put trash and junk and cups and, and food plates and junk all over every city of America while we're, you know, having a nervous fit over air conditioning the Russians are out looking for oil, and the exact same week, they found a new oil field as big, they say, as the Gulf of Mexico. And so our culture is preaching scarcity, scarcity, scarcity. But the God that you and I serve, see, and that's part of why they hate that God of Abraham. Jesus, they can twist and manipulate and portray him as what he's not. But they hate that God of Abraham because that God of Abraham is El Shaddai. He is the God of more than enough. He's not just the God of enough. He's the God of more than enough. Tell your neighbor, this church is counterculture. Second Corinthians 9-11, you'll be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And Ephesians 3.20 tells us that God is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. So God wants you to have more than enough. We know God's will by God's word. There's no mystery to it. When God called Abraham in Genesis 12, he wanted Abraham to learn how to walk in financial covenant with God, with this God. God told Abraham to leave, lead, leave, and to follow. Abraham heard God, Abraham believed God, and Abraham obeyed God. And when God appeared once again to Abraham, Abraham at age 99 in Genesis 17, it says, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, El Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. I am the Almighty God, El Shaddai, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. El Shaddai means the God who is more than enough. He doesn't just want you to have enough, he wants you to have more than enough. You know, we just can't figure it out, man. You know, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, we're blind. It's like our culture is blind. It's like our leaders are blind. It's like the universities are dumb. I mean, we got evangelical churches. We got Christians. We got pastors. Well, I, I just don't know that we ought to prosper. You know, I just don't know about tithes and offerings. And while we're doing that, Qatar and all those countries, Saudi Arabia, they're funding the Islamic State. They're funding Al-Qaeda. They're funding the Muslim Brotherhood. They're funding Arab Spring. Funding, 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 funding. And then somebody gets their head chopped off, not in Iraq, in Oklahoma. Are we stoned? Those people couldn't last a week against the United States of America without some serious funding. Right. Funding. 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 Well, I just, I just don't know. I just don't know if we ought to, you know, pastors talking about success, prosperity. And I, I don't know, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want a job. <laughs> I want to live with my mommy. I don't need a woman. You know, I can take care of myself. No. Nope. The boys growing up in this church, that's why we got them playing football. They need to get tackled. They need to play basketball. They need to get fouled. They need to learn about competition. Amen. 
They need to learn you don't win every game. They need to learn that when you get knocked down, you get the wind knocked out of you, you just stand back up and you just suck it up, tough it out, and you go back and you go, get back in the game. Amen. Right? That's right. Because that, whether we want to admit it or not, man, that world out there, once you come out of high school, once you get that college degree, once you go out there and apply for the job, man, it's, com it's competitive. People can say whatever they want to say, but it's competitive. But whether or not you prosper, whether or not you experience God's best is up to you. Will you believe God? Will you believe his word? Will you say what God's word says? Will you do what God's word says to do? Will you determine to experience the best that God has for you? Will you determine to prosper? See, you make your way, your life prosperous and successful, but it's up to you. Now let's wrap up this morning in Joshua. Let's go to the book of Joshua chapter 1. Joshua 1, we're wrapping up. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give you, to give to them, you, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. In other words, God's not any respecter of persons. He made these promises to Moses, but guess what? Joshua can collect. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. Look at verse 5. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? I said, wow, doesn't that sound familiar? Who else said, I will never leave you or forsake you? And then look at verse 6. He says, be strong and courageous. Now, you can play around with God if you want to. In the Ebola days. But the thought would never cross my mind. You know, so we have a couple of situations where you know, we're going to be flying here in the next couple of months. And Sue said, you know, well, what about, you know, all these people on these airplanes and getting stuck in an airplane in a small environment, recycled air. I said, that has nothing to do with me. Amen. And instantly, smart, she said, that has nothing to do with me either. <laughs> See, we're coming into times where your, your multivitamins may not get it. Are you hearing me? Yes. We're coming into days where you might need a covenant. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What did Jesus say? Nothing shall by any means harm you. See, what you believe matters, and what you say matters, and what you do matters. And so here the Lord said, be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Verse 7, in case you missed it, Joshua. Be strong and very courageous. And then he said, be careful to obey all the law. How much of the law? All. all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Now, don't you know that God said, I am the Lord, I change not? If he wanted Joshua to be successful wherever Joshua went, has he changed his mind? Does he want you to not be successful? And if he didn't want us to know about it, why did he write it down and let it be preserved for posterity in the Bible?
Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And so we began the message by saying that you are the sum total of everything you have believed and everything you have said and everything you have done. And this success formula to Joshua has to do with meditating on the Word of God, which affects what you believe, getting it into your heart. And do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. There it is. So it's not just a matter of what is in my heart. It's a matter of what's coming out of my mouth. And what's coming out of my mouth inevitably is a reflection of what I have sown into my heart. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what is coming out of my mouth is inevitably a, a betrayal of what I believe. That you may be careful to do everything written in it. And so one of the latest things being taught in churches is an old heresy. You can look it up, Google it, antinomianism. And it's an ancient heresy that our conduct does not have to line up to our faith. This is just nuts. If, if somebody was a thief and they get saved, they ought not be a thief now. If somebody was an adulterer and they get saved, they ought not be an adulterer today. Right? Our lifestyle should be a reflection of our Christian faith. And if our lifestyle does not say Christian, well, are we? So what we do matters. And I don't know why people just don't seem to have common sense on this. You know, one of my uncles, my favorite uncle actually, was worth I don't know exactly. He was worth more than a million dollars when he died. High school graduate, never had a white collar job, worked for Chrysler. But here's what, here's what he told me. He said, he said, Jeannie said, he said, I worked with the guys and he said they gambled every paycheck. I worked with guys and they were always going to Vegas. I worked with guys who would get married, get divorced, get married, get divorced, get married, get divorced. And, and he said, it's no wonder people don't have anything. And, and he was not what we would say a model citizen. He did get divorced, and then, you know, he couldn't live without her. So at least when he married the same woman, at least the assets came back together. <laughs> That's an idea. And he was Missouri Synod Lutheran, and so they're allowed to drink. And so he drank a little, and he smoked a little. I mean, he, he, was, he didn't, like, come right down the line like I would say, because I would say that if you just gave up beer and cigarettes and invested that money, that by itself would make you a millionaire. But still, he did not waste money. He didn't go to Vegas. He didn't gamble. In other words, so, but see, the, the person who does go to Vegas, they're upset because they think they should have what you have. The person who does not go to work tomorrow morning is upset because they think they should have what you have. The person who did, who did not get a high school degree, they're upset with you because they think they should have what you have. The person who did not get a college degree, they're upset with you because they think they should have what you have. The world doesn't work this way. And the further we as a people get from the earth, the dumber we get. Anybody who spent any time on a farm knows if you don't sow, you don't reap. And if you plant corn, you're not going to get tomatoes. You reap what you sow and you reap more than you sow. And this is true in any area of life. And so God himself, say it out loud, God himself. Say it again, God himself. Say it again, God himself. God himself gave Joshua a success formula. Meditate on the word, speak the word, and be a doer of the word of God or be obedient to the word of God. And then I brought the New King James Version of, of verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Say it out loud. I make my own way, my own way. Prosperous. prosperous. 
Say it again. I make my own way prosperous. So you're in the driver's seat. So sitting here today, you are the sum total of everything you have believed, everything you have said, and everything you have done. We make our own way prosperous by what we believe, by what we say, and by what we do. And no one can do it for you. I can't do it for you. You have to make your own way prosperous by what you believe, by what you say, and by what you do. God loves you. I said God loves you. And God has a wonderful plan for your life. But you know what? Even God can't do it for you because we have to believe. It's hardly any different than making Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of our life. We have to do what Abraham did. We have to hear, we have to believe, and then we have to obey.